Hello, this is Joe McGee. You know, we've been doing seminars across the country for years. Seminars on marriage, parenting, men, money, and family. We want to encourage you to email us and let us know if this podcast has helped you. Or maybe you have joined us live at one of our seminars. If you have a testimony, you just want to tell us what God's doing in your life, please email us at mail at joemcgeeministries.com or you can contact us through our website, joemcgeeministries.com. There you will find helpful articles and tools to help you grow in God, your marriage, and your family. We love you guys, and we hope you enjoy the podcast. You know, when God created the earth, everything was just right. Put man in it. He only wanted one thing out of man. He just wanted a relationship. That's all he wanted. I want to be good to him, bless him. I just want to hang out with him. I want you to hang out with me, but I want you to choose. The problem is, you know, nobody wanted to hang out with him. Everybody sort of went their separate way. Only one family that kind of had an interest, and that was Noah's family. So there was a big flood, and God started all over again. So, well, maybe this time, you know, I'm trying to be good to somebody. I want, just want you to want to hang out with me. And, of course, Noah had his sons. They all scattered, and it went downhill from there again. And God said, okay, we're going to do this a little different. We're going to start with one family, one man, Abraham. He seems to love me. He'll teach his children and his children's children. So I'm going to establish something with one family, a covenant. We're going to establish a covenant, and then out of his family line, I'm going to be able to send my son. We're going to fix this thing permanently. And so the whole first half of the Old Testament is God trying to establish that family line with Abraham. You know, and it got scary sometimes. You know, they'd break and run, and, you know, it got a little thin. We got down to about one or two people every now and then, but but we made it through, and then uh, finally established a a nation. and, And the second half of the Old Testament is God trying to get... Israel to want to hang out with him and worship him. And they kept wanting, you know, carve tree stumps and, you know, <laughs> pile some rocks up and do hoodoo dances and stuff. And it didn't go good. But finally, through that whole deal, we come to the New Testament where God was able to send his son to earth to fix it. And Jesus came to die for us, for our sins, so that what God wants out of you and I, he doesn't want perfection. He just wants faith. He just wants us to trust him. That's why we're not perfect yet. We're just headed that direction. But thank God Jesus came to do what he did, so we don't have to pay for our sins, so we don't have to, you know, put 40,000 bulls and goats on the altar out here in the middle of Birmingham and smell this place up. <laughs> yeah, it's just a faith thing now. And so I, I was thinking about teaching our kids. I want to read you something out of John chapter 10. This is a real famous passage of Scripture, New Testament, John chapter 10. Uh, I want to read the New Living Translation. I'm going to jump in about verse 6 and just listen while I read. It says, uh, Jesus was talking, giving an illustration. They didn't understand what he was saying. They said, those who heard Jesus use this illustration, did not understand what he meant, so he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. He said, yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely, and they will find good pastors. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That that ought to go in the refrigerator. Everybody say satisfied. Now, we've all been satisfied at some point in our life, and that's a really good thing. And everybody's been unsatisfied or dissatisfied, like you ever bought something, got home with it, and you weren't satisfied? Well, it's mine now. You know, sometimes it happens when you get married. You find somebody, you want to play kissy face and hug. And, you know, you're pretty, you're handsome, you're witty, you're all this. And you get married, and it's like, I don't like you. I didn't know you, you know, and this wasn't what I thought. And what happened? That's why they tell you in the world to take a lot of pictures on your wedding day because it goes downhill from there. <laughs> but that's the world. Jesus said, I want you to have a rich and satisfying life. Not without opposition. We all have opposition, but I want you to be satisfied. But look what he says about how this is going to happen. He said, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hen will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him, and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hen runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. There's a secret to having a satisfied life. If you're not spending your time helping somebody else, living for somebody else, sacrifice for somebody else, we're not satisfied because that's what we were created to do. God left us here so we could be a blessing, the salt and the light and help other people. That's why almost all marriages that are in trouble are in trouble for one basic reason, selfishness. It's I, me, and I, and mine, and I'm not getting this, you're not doing, you said, and you shouldn't have said, and you didn't do, and you should have done. And it's like most all marriage counseling we do, it's just a lot of thumb sucking. Really, it's just like, well, bless your heart. We just send you back to kindergarten. If we can grow you up, we can fix this thing. But that's, 
because you know that I, I think I've taught it many times. I've taught teenagers so long. It's like the loser's limp that old Zig Ziglar used to teach about. You know, if I'd only had a daddy, I'd have been somebody. If I just had a mom, I'd have been somebody. If I just finished school, I'd have been somebody. If coach had played me, I'd have been somebody. If he hadn't fired me, I'd have been somebody. You know, it's always somebody else's fault that you're not happy. And if you're going to live that way, you will not be happy because God designed us to live one way, living for others. Because he's going to give us a grace to do that. But what happens is we don't know God. We kind of hold on to our love and our patience and our money and our time because we don't want to deplete our source because we've not found a source yet. Jesus said this, I sacrifice. Look what else he says. He said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. They know me just as my father knows me and I know the father. So I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them in also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. I have authority to lay it down, and when I want to, I can also take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. Now, basically, it's this. He said this. He said, listen, if I'm doing what I do because the Father loves me, because I'm, I'm, I'm putting this on the line. I'm sacrificing. The hireling only goes into a relationship, only takes a job, only goes to school for whatever he can get out of it. That's a hireling. Jesus said, my people go into something for what they can give, not what they can get. Now, anybody here has been married any length of time, my wife and I just celebrated our 36th wedding anniversary. And, and there were some great years and there were some bad years. Because after a while, you know, you get weary and well-doing. I'm tired of being nice. <laughs> and it's your turn to be nice. I was nice last year. You're going to be nice this year. And there's not that sacrificial, put it on the line. That's why Jesus told husbands, love your wife like Jesus loved you. When you weren't lovable, he loved you. You're going to have to do extra. See, nobody told us about the extra when the wedding thing was going on. I mean, we said some words, you know, what word? I don't remember, you know, life, death, until one of us drops or something. I don't know. <laughs> and you get men, all of a sudden it's not fun anymore, man. The refrigerator starts to wear out and the dryer door won't stay shut and the transmission's leaking, you know, and you're putting on 50 extra pounds, hair's growing out of years, stuff off your head, makeup's not coming on anymore. We're looking scary. <laughs> and this was not what I bargained for. We don't know how to do extra. See, God said this in Ephesians 3.20. God does exceeding abundantly above and beyond. We are made in God's image. If we're going to live a satisfied life, we're going to have to do like God does. We're going to have to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond with everything we touch. We don't go one mile. The Bible says we go two miles. If you're not willing to sacrifice, you don't have the kind of life that Jesus promised. It's just that you can't just show up and be a Christian and, get, and be blessed. It doesn't happen that way. My son came to me last year. He was a junior. He's a senior this year in high school. and Going into senior year of football. And it's been good, but it hasn't been great. It's been good, not great. He's starting some, but not all the time. He's frustrated. He said, Dad, for all the time I've put in, all this, you think maybe I'll get a starting position this year? I mean, since I'm going to be a senior? I said, son, let me explain something. There's no tenure here at this high school. <laughs> just because you've been here the longest doesn't get you anything. I said, son, I love you, and you're good, but you're not that good. So if you're going to earn a starting position, you'll have to do something extra. Your sister did. I had one of our daughters, my second daughter. We've got six kids. My second daughter, she was an all-state basketball player, but not because she was pretty, not because she's a Christian, not because she's mine. <laughs> Bless your heart. Kumbaya. <laughs> Jessica would go to school like everybody else, go to class like everyone else, go to practice, come home, do her homework, eat dinner. And then she'd go outside at nighttime and turn on the floodlights on the basketball court in the wintertime. And she would shoot hoops. Boom. Boom. Nobody rebounded. Boom, boom. I mean, I remember standing hollering, Jesse, come in, go to bed. In a minute, you know, just boom, boom, boom. But you know what? All that paid off that sacrifice. She ended up being a three-point shooting champion in the state of Oklahoma. Her, uh, her team won the three state championship. She was a starting point guard. All that paid off. She didn't get that because she was cute, and she is. <laughs> she didn't get it because she's blue-eyed and blonde-haired and left-handed, and my daughter, and Jesus loves it. You get it because you do something. Next. We're just like God. We want to have something, do something. Get up and do something. Quit crying about what you don't have and get up and do something. I was telling my son, I said, son, you can't just show up to practice. You're not that good. You have to do extra. I've told you forever. You've got to do something besides regular practice. And so he came about a week later and we had sort of a big disagreement. He was going to quit baseball in his junior year. So I'm not going to do baseball, Dad. I'm going to go to the weight room. I'm going to start working on my skills and, and I'm going to go to camps this summer and I want to work on this. I want to earn a starting position this year. I said, son, you're not quitting anything. And we had a big argument about it. And, but then I gave in because his mom agreed with him and I, you know how that goes. <laughs> and it ended up they were both right and I was wrong.
Because he did, he did stay in the weight room. Boy, he bulked up and, and he'd go to school in the summertime. He'd show up at 6 a.m. and they'd run from 6 to 8 and they'd pump iron from 8 to 10. Then he'd go to work. He, he dropped 35 pounds last summer. He's a lineman. He's an offensive guard and defensive tackle. He got down to 215. Coaches were mad. So, son, you lose too much weight and you, you don't have enough beef. You know, but man, he got strong. And so when he showed up in August for practice, they couldn't believe how strong he was. His whole body type changed. His whole attitude changed. Nobody could move him. And so not only did he earn a starting position, but he played both sides of the ball you know iron man ball all season he played offensive guard and when it switched he played defensive tackle which makes you really good because when you're an offensive guard and you play defensive tackle you know what he's thinking you know what he's i play your position i know exactly what you're doing his team voted him one of the four captains of the team starting the season he led the team out on the field all season not only started but led the team onto the field they went undefeated won the championship and they're standing there in the last game of the season holding that trophy up in the middle of the field and we went out and all the dads and moms are talking to him men are soaked with sweat and it's like can you believe it? the first undefeated team from this school i says this feel good he said what i says this feel good i said was it worth the sacrifice all those mornings can you remember the mornings you know the throwing up the pumping iron you didn't sleep in. You weren't watching cartoons, sucking milkshakes, running around McDonald's at night. You were working out. Remember that summer? Is it worth it? For the feeling you feel right now, was it, was it worth the satisfaction that you feel right now? He said, yes, it was. Yes, Dad, it was. It's incredible to do this, to have this. I'll be able to bring my grandchildren back here to the school one day, and our picture will be hanging in that locker room. First undefeated team out of the school. I was captain of the first undefeated team out of the school. Went from just hanging out and showing up to doing something. If you don't do extra, you don't get extra. You can't just get married and have a great marriage. You've got to do something. You've got to date and kiss your face. And, you know, you've got to put on the apron around 7 o'clock, guys. If you want mom to play kiss your face at 11, you need an apron on the 7. Hey, thanks for listening today. Be sure to join us Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to hear more of what God can do in your life. He's got a great future for you and your family, and we are here to help you get there. Make sure and go to our website, joebiggieministries.com. We've got all sorts of materials, books, DVDs, you name it, all there to help you, your marriage, and your family succeed.